Hello, I'm Earl Weinberg, and this is Book Circle Presents The Cavalry Cycle. We're going to continue our reading of Thirty Toes Short. They led their horses through the streets to the corral, where they joined the horses from the other stables. For Fletcher's benefit, the trainees remarked aloud on the state of the water troughs and the presence of shade trees. Eowick, born, buoyed up and completely restored by the sight of so many horses, started bouncing from back to back, inspecting, calming, and breaking up spats. That done, they adjourned to the Bethos, where, with the assistance of Peach, who was an expedition veteran of even longer standing than Nuck, Fletcher showed them how to get a horse into one of the slings they rode for most of the voyage. Then they learned how to get themselves into their own slings. These were slightly different, being designed so the occupant could release themselves. And there are these pockets, Fletcher pointed out, where you can stow books and a few personal effects. Do tell us if you get any coverage on your phones. Then it was back to stevedore work. The loads were not as heavy, but they needed to be stored and stowed and secured more carefully under the direction of the Bethos crew, whom they thus started to work with. Late in the afternoon, they were able to stop for lunch, a big lunch, with oatmeal for the equine course, to which they were encouraged to add sugar, honey, chopped fruit, syrup, anything for calories. Feel your oats, lads. You'll be burning them. Buck Jack heard Carlin swallow hard. He looked up from his bowl and saw Petra Vincent, now in a spring green flapper outfit, talking to Captain Fletcher. Fletcher pointed to them and then followed Mademoiselle Vincent across the courtyard to them. Oops, Buck Jack asked Carlin. Nah, to be expected. He was already standing, they usually ate standing, but he straightened up, put down his bowl, quickly brushed his beard in case of oatmeal bits, absent, and prepared to greet. Buck Jack followed suit. Fletcher stopped a length away, but stood openly listening. Mademoiselle Vincent came on. Carlin tipped hat and smiled, then took the extended hand. Bon après-midi, Monsieur Carlin, she said, and gave a flash of smile to Buck Jack, too. He says he does not know your schedule, but he is happy to receive you at any time tonight at the Four Stones, and I will be happy to escort you there if you do not know the way. Come through the gate nearest town. You are very kind, mademoiselle. The flower-faced smile became a little grim. Not at all. My schedule is very open. A biento once more, then. Smiles all around, then she turned and left. Buckjack noticed that she cast a shadow, though a faint one, and her high-heeled shoes sounded on the dirt, though slightly. No one, he saw, noticed her passage. He looked back to Fletcher, who was gazing at them, particularly Carlin. Well, mes jolies poulain, what was that about? Buck Jack felt his infamous blush rising. But Carlin had, as he said, expected it. He maintained his stance at attention and saluted. Fletcher's eyes flickered over this curiously. Usually Carlin was but minimally respectful. Sir, if I have free time tonight, I'd like to go to La Forêt de Brickell. There's a fay there called the Fanatour. He makes shore leave belts for merfolk. I want to talk to him, see what it would take to get a shore leave belt for Harry Morley. After a short, startled silence, Fletcher asked, Who is Harry Morley? A friend of Weldon's, sir. Fletcher looked to Buckjack, who was still doing his own startled silence. So that was the deal Carlin had been working on. Had he gone back to talk to Harry about it? Please, no, it would be like promising to buy him a winning lottery ticket. But Fletcher was still staring at him. Mr. Weldon, I can see this is news to you too, but who is Harry Morley? Uh, uh, an old neighbor, sir. Uh, he briefly recounted Harry's story. So, said Fletcher, who had been looking at Carlin all the while Buck Jack spoke, a worthy endeavor. But what makes you think the Fanatour is ready to produce a shore leave belt for Mr. Morley? I don't know that he is, sir, Carlin answered, and I know they take a lot of time and power and the skill isn't common, but I just want to see what can be done. Maybe get the ball rolling on something. Maybe just ask him what it would take. That's all, sir. Hmm. Spend seven years weaving a shirt out of nettles without ever breaking silence, that kind of thing? I hope not, sir, but I want to find out. Fletcher went on looking. 
Carlin showed his mettle by not squirming. As Buckjack had said, Fletcher was good at keeping secrets. So how much of Carlin's story did he already know? How much of it did he guess? Because, though Fletcher had never admitted it to the class, he was widely believed to be receptant, or sighted, or sensitive, or whatever you wanted to call it, and was therefore a very good guesser. Very well, he said at last, when you're done for the day, your free time is your own, as I always say, and your training to be explorers, so go explore, another thing I always say. Sir, Buck Jack heard himself say, may I go with him? I, uh, I think the buddy system might be a good idea. Hmm, yes. In fact, you relieve my mind a bit. You both know your manners around Faze, right? Eowick never complained of you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But be sure to take your walkie-talkies. If you run into trouble in the woods, use them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Fletcher gave each of them another searching look, stared off into the distance for a bit, waiting for any news his receptants might gather, Buck Jack guessed, then nodded, wheeled, and went back to his desk of crates, there to confer with Lieutenant Sanders, who, it occurred to Buck Jack, was equally good at keeping secrets. Buck Jack fumbled in his kit, found the walkie-talkie, and set it back, marking the place for when he needed it. Might need it. He looked up and saw Carlin staring at him. What brought that on? his friend asked. I mean, thanks, but why? Putty system, you heard, it's only sensible. It relieved his mind, even. Anyway, Harry's my old neighbor, so this is my business, too. Though I did not know that until five minutes ago. Carlin grinned back in full form. Yeah, well, gotta keep you guys off balance. You're doing beautifully. Then it was back to the Bethos to be shown where and how to stow their gear, be run through emergency procedures, practice hauling and stowing lines, and while you're at it, do some more loading. What happened to being scholars on hooves? Buck Jack asked Fells as they waited in line on the loading ramp. That's later, I expect, the Palomino answered. If you see any interesting botanical specimens around the loading dock, do tell me. Meanwhile, I've got these tubs of, he checked the label, fiberglass resin paste to load. After that, it was back to the corral to check on the horses, exercise them on lead, rub them down and feed them. Then go back to the ship and clean decks, because people, many of them in horseshoes, had been trampling all over them. I think the hull is getting quite a bit deeper than it was yesterday morning, Charlie Horse observed. A mermaid's laugh came up from the water. It'll be deeper still when all you a lot and your cousins get aboard. Eventually, they were back at the caravansary, having dinner under a slow summer sunset. So, any time tonight, she said, Buck Jack remarked. When does tonight start? After sundown? I guess. We could start a little before that, if you like. Yeah, that would be good. It was getting hard to eat. Both stomachs were knotting up, and he found himself tending to prance in place. Not Carlin's happy, cocky prance, either. Deliberately not prancing, he started for Fletcher's corner of the courtyard. Hey, whoa, said Carlin, we're not ready. He waved at Buck Jack and then himself. We need to clean up and put on dress uniform, show some respect. I wasn't heading out. I wanted to ask Fletcher what he knew about the Fanatour. Oh, good idea. So Carlin came along. Fletcher was in the same corner of the courtyard, flipping through papers on a clipboard. Next to him sat Lieutenant Sanders, trying to use his forelegs as a lap for a laptop computer. We loaded our desks a couple of hours ago, he remarked as they approached and saluted. But does the paperwork stop? No. What can I do for you, gentlemen? Sir, what do you know about the Thanator? Buck Jack asked. Ah, good question. Well, he's one of the most powerful Fays in La Forêt de Briquel, maybe the most powerful, but he's still one of the Channel Fays, so he's under the pact. And he's not like a local fairy king or anything, it's just that I doubt there are any other Fays here who'd want to cross him. Buck Jack and Carlin nodded. Fays were either very individualistic or very collective. In that, as in many other things, they had few middle gears. Fletcher eyed them. What do you know about dealing with Fays? We probably ought to have a class in it, but we tend to assume everyone learned it on their mother's knee. 
Mr. Weldon, I recall you grew up next to a fay wood. Just a little patch of one, but yes, sir. And what were you taught about dealing with fays? My dad said they value good manners like silver and true promises like gold, and bad manners and broken promises like nettles and poison. Fletcher nodded, satisfied. And you, Mr. Carlin? He delivered a practiced grin of confidence. Not a lot of fays in London, sir, not to admit to it, but my old line of work taught me the same lessons. Fletcher nodded again, but more cautiously. Then I don't have anything to add. Good luck, lads. They thanked him, saluted, and returned to their pitch. On the way back, Buck Jack asked, Have you spoken to Harry about this? Of course not. What if it doesn't pan out? Good. I just wondered because of the way you trotted back to the docks right after we met Mademoiselle Petra the first time. Ah, that. I thought, what if I strike it really lucky and the Fanatour can start work right away? You heard, hope for the best, plan for the worst? Well, sometimes you ought to plan for the best, too. And plainly, he did not want to say more just then. Back at their pitch, Carlin seized his toiletries kit, then headed for the pump in the middle of the courtyard. Buck Jack followed suit. There, they stripped off their sweaty t-shirts and washed. Returning to the pitch, Carlin took out a mirror and surprised Buck Jack by trimming the handlebars off his mustache and retrimming and waxing it into a solid, serious bar. He trimmed off the curl on the point of his beard, too, but re-waxed and combed it to an assertive forward prowl. Buck Jack, continuing to follow suit now, got out a smaller mirror, and his scissors, and started trying to trim. He found his head seized and turned. Carlin proceeded to trim his beard for him. Anyone would think we had hot dates lined up, he murmured through stiff lips, not wanting to throw off Carlin's aim. Later, Carlin answered, if we're celebrating. How's that? He presented Buck Jack with his mirror. Buck Jack saw beard and hair both in an unaccustomed state of neatness. He thanked his barber. Then they donned their dress jackets and hats. I wondered why we had to pack these, Buck Jack remarked. I mean, we're off to survey howling interdimensional wilderness. Now you know, Carlin answered. You never know who you might meet out there, and you'll want to make a good impression. Well, if we were turning things up to 11, Buck Jack started transferring the fishing lures from his duty hat to the band of his dress hat. Carlin saw and gave him a congratulatory wink. Good idea, he said, and installed his own over the curl of his custom hat. Then he broke out the hoof polish. By the time they were done, their classmates and a scattering of other folk had gathered around to watch. Dancing at the cheese buoy, Charlie Horse asked. All night dressage contest? Court martial? Evening services, you heathens, said Carlin, and headed out. Buck Jack seconded his mysterious smile and followed. The back streets of the little town had no light but the sky and the houses. Buck Jack was grateful for his good night vision, though Carlin seemed to be doing fine. He felt at his belt for the walkie-talkie. We call for help on these, he said, taking his out, staring at it and reclipping. What do you think Fletcher will do? Cavalry charge to the rescue? It seemed unlikely. Carlin thought so, too. He shook his head. Psych him out. That's his style. Stand to attention, you horrible little goblin. I knew your father when he was a gremlin. Buck Jack laughed a little nervously. That's not much his style, either. Oh, hey, do you have the amulet? No, I thought about it, but it probably wouldn't work against a guy who may be the most powerful fay in Brickell. And it could make us look less than candid. Like, what are we hiding? Buck Jack nodded. I see. OK. They headed inland rather than north, as they had last night. It was not long before Cote Dice was behind them. Before them, beyond a bit of meadow, loomed La Forêt de Briquel, darker than the eastern sky behind it. As at the other gate, a path led up to a pair of square-cut pillars flanking a break in a wall of dry, unworked stone. On each pillar was carved the trefoil of oak, ash, and thorn leaves. In the gateway, an uncertain flicker of light kindled, steadied, grew, and illuminated Mademoiselle Petra. Or, possibly, she had simply appeared and glowed. Monsieur, bonsoir, she greeted them. Return and we return. Keep faith and so do we. Bonsoir, mademoiselle, Carlin returned. 
And thank you for making this meeting possible, they tipped hats. My pleasure. She led them single file down a path just barely wide enough. Ahead of Buckjack, Carlin had slowed. There was tiptoe rather than prance in his gait now. He was feeling his way. He looked over his shoulder back at Buckjack. Denise, Christ! And it was as if the back half of him tried to bolt. There were fey realms where that exclamation would have had repercussions, but not here. Petra simply turned and said, what? Oh, and stared at Buckjack as Carlin was doing. What is it? He asked. Those damn eyes of yours, Carlin answered. They're shining like blue blazes from Mad Mademoiselle Petra's light. I was going to ask if the walkie-talkies had flashlights, but you don't care, do you? And he put his left hand behind his foreleg where the larger of his hearts was hammering. Well, yes, they have flashlights. Remember last night on the road? I, uh, I can't do anything about my eyes. Carlin waved the issue away. Petra stared at Buckjack's face and said, Très intéressant, but if you need more light, I can accommodate. Smiling, she raised her hands theatrically. The light that shone on or from her pale skin and silvery dress increased. Carlin thanked her and proceeded more easily. But for Buckjack, it just meant that he lost his dark adaptation and the woods on either side were pitch black. Presumably, they had always been so for Carlin and were still, but now he could see the path. Buckjack told himself that this was no worse than the oak wood, the bit of fey wood behind his family's home, but he had not made a habit of walking there at night either. There were no voices, no footfalls, no distant fires. He thought of Eowick, whom he saw every day, formidable and peppery, but only in the cause of the horses they both loved. He thought of Mademoiselle Petra herself, past death, but in the act of helping them right now. There were fays, but not to be dreaded. Yes, but they were known quantities, not watching silently, invisibly. Well, so were these other fays, knowable anyway, if not known. He turned away from Petra's ghost light and let his eyes adapt back. Trees in twilight, stars through branches. It was only a little shock and then a relief to see a little face up in the leaves, the color and texture of smooth bark staring back at him curiously. He waved and the wood fay waved back. What can you tell us about the Thanatur? Carlin asked Petra. Thanatur, shape master. The title is not an idle boast. He is skilled at glamour and seemings and true shapeshift, and he is uh, playful. He likes to combine the three along with plain disguise until you do not know where you are. He does not hide his identity, or he hides well enough not to get caught, but no one is sure what is his true appearance. He is as shiftable as a puka, but also he makes seemings and such for others. He can certainly make the shore leaf belt. Good, but what are his pleasures or his goals? I have to be able to offer him something. Ah, true. Well, one can say that he is complet with shape games now, has mastered them, and now he wishes to be a fey lord. One may say he is a fey lord because he has formed a troop, though it is still small and his command of it is simple. Troops were fey's being collective. They were united at a deep spiritual level, able to pool magical power and coordinate effort with great facility, but unable to think individually or coherently for long. They often lost track of time and fell into trances or frenzies. Fays able to take themselves and others in and out of troops and command those troops were the fairy lords and ladies. Fletcher had told them the Fanatur was not a local king, but that information was starting to become out of date. I myself became Fay by joining the Fanatur's troop, she told them. That was how it was done. Mortals became Fays by joining troops, alive or dead, willingly or not. The pact stipulated willingly. You aren't a troop member now, are you? Carlin asked. No. When he did that for me, I made the condition that I stay only briefly. Because that stay was short, I owe him a great favor. What favor? Carlin's voice was calm, but Buckjack saw his tail tuck in. 
He felt again for the walkie-talkie and reminded himself of the pact. Not specified. Something will present itself in due course. And in due course, after branches and turns, the path ended in a clearing. It was far larger than the caravansary courtyard. The bethos could have been dry docked in it with room to spare. It was level grass, mid-shin high on Petra. In the middle, four stones, rough-hewn, upright, twice taller than men, stood in a house-sized square, the diagonals of the square pointing in the cardinal directions. Petra led the way into the square. As they went, the clearing began to fill up. Human-like figures came striding out of the woods. Some were silhouettes in the gloaming. Some were translucent. Some gleamed like Petra. Some were child-high. The grass rustled as yet shorter creatures moved through it. Fireflies and less visible insects drifted in the air, heedless of a scattering of crows, owls, and hawks. Not going to be a private talk, Buck Jack murmured. That's good, Carlin declared. Everything above board. As they approached one of the four stones, a shape came out from behind the stone diagonally opposite. A mounted figure, but not, as Buck Jack studied it, a man on horseback. The mount gave the first impression of being a shining black horse with bold white markings, but it was no horse. The black face gazed out of a white mane that waved and curled over the whole neck and shoulders like a lion's. The tail was also lion-like, black with a long white tuft. The black legs shook gleaming white feathering, but from the slight sound of them were padded, not hoofed. Beautiful, but not a horse. No more was the rider a mortal man. Like his mount, he was a bold study in black and white, but he was also a study in invisibility. He wore Stetson, a cowboy hat like Buck Jackson Carlin's, but with white crown and black brim. Below the hat, a white face mask floated on vacuity, while black sunglasses covered the eye holes. Below that, white shirt sleeves with black sleeves, then white gloves holding reins, gaps fleetingly visible where wrists should be, then black pants and white boots seated on a white saddle. The cut and fabric looked like standard cavalry, but for the coloring, there were no insignia. Good evening, Mr. Carlin. Return and we return. The voice was blank and bland like the face, and like it, somewhat more masculine than not, but mostly featureless. The Chanelais had no trace of English, French, Russian, Italian, or any other accent. The mouth moved naturally. Good evening, sir, Carlin answered promptly, cheerfully. Keep faith and so do we. Thanks for seeing me. The Thanator swung out of the saddle and clapped the mount beast on the neck. It flowed into a tall man, dressed in black with white boots, belt, gloves, and Stetson. He bowed to the Thanator, respectful but not servile, and walked into the shadows. Shadows. There was much more light in the square of the four stones than there had been. Without craning his neck to peer around, which would be gauche, Buck Jack guessed the stars were shining too brightly, but for them alone. You want to discuss getting a shore leave belt for a merman? Yes, sir, but not to make an offer for one. No, sir, I don't expect I could afford it now, but if you're willing, sir, I would like to see what could be done. See if it could be paid for in installments, for instance. Mm. The little noise was unenthusiastic, but the Thanator beckoned them further into the square. At least, he beckoned Carlin. Buck Jack decided to take the gesture as applying to himself as well. It was hard to tell with those sunglasses hiding the eyes that were probably empty holes anyway. But just then, a pale light shone from behind the glasses, and the Thanator cocked his head, or his mask. What is your interest in this, Merman? Why do you care? Is he a friend? He's my friend, sir, Buck Jack announced. And you are? Cavalryman John Weldon, sir. He bowed a little, tipping his hat, and got a nod back. I introduced him to Mr. Carlin here just yesterday. The symbol of a face turned back to Carlin. Then I still don't see why you care. He was transformed by force, sir, Carlin said, a few years ago in England. I 
have a special resentment of that kind of crime. I want to do what I can to help him recover. The light behind the glasses flickered and brightened. The fanateur cocked his head the other way. I see. He paced back and forth, approaching them as he did so, looking Carlin over, and himself, Buck Jack realized, and Petra, who had come into the square with them. The fanateur clasped his gloves behind his back. Merfolk vary a great deal. One has the tail of a giant herring, another is part shark, a third is trout or eel, and so on. That is why each shore leave belt is an individual study. Yes, sir, I know. Carlin reached into his belt pouch and extracted a little dab of white. That's why I brought this, sir, in case we were able to come to an agreement. I thought it might help you start work sooner. It's a bit of cotton, sir, with his blood on it. Buck Jack remembered the shaving cut that morning. You stole this from him? There was no expression in the voice, not even a dangerous flatness, but the light behind the glasses dimmed and yellowed, whatever that might mean. No, sir, he cut himself shaven and threw it away. Mm. Best would have been freely given knowing why, but still useful. Blood means a lot, of course. Well, I have an offer to make you, though not the long piecemeal sort you suggested. That presents a long time in which things could go wrong. As you may know, I am building up a troop. The mask briefly faced Petra, then turned aside. He raised his arm and beckoned again. Come. Out of the shadow moved a block of lesser shadows, leaving a gap in the ring of observers. They looked normal for a group of fays. Most were specters, ex-mortal ex-ghosts like Petra, but more were transparent, dimmer. Some squirrel-sized little folk and a few birds perched somehow on ghostly shoulders. There were two or three child-sized folk and one, Buck Jack thought sure, actual child. Worrying. Maybe two dozen in all. They did not look atypical for Faze, it was the way they moved. They walked in a tight knot, touching or nearly so, but no one bumped into another, no one tripped over another's feet. They moved smoothly, as the unit they were. They stared attentively at the Fanatur, then with curiosity at the Centaurs, then longer at Petra, then back to the Fanatur and eyes and heads all turned in perfect synchrony. You were in that? Buck Jack asked Petra as softly as he could. Yes, it was like a dream, like a drug. I was not me in there. Perhaps the Fanatur heard them. They are, I freely admit, a beginner's troop. Regardless of form, they are all trivial ghosts, the kind no greater power claims. They need a firm hand and so are tightly bound. As this is my first venture at ordering a troop, I must apply the same rigor to all. None of the troop reacted to this assessment of their souls, any more than dogs when their master discusses their breeding. They learned much from Petra, he continued, but she did not stay. They remember her knowledge and skills, but her virtues went with her. He smiled pleasantly at Petra, her return smile was tight. So, to build character as to build character as well as numbers, I need new and better recruits. The mask turned once more to Carlin. You, sir, are brave, generous, and inventive. You would make a splendid addition to the troop. I always keep work in hand, and with the blood you have there, I could finish a belt tonight, fit it out for your friend in return for your service. Carlin's face was white. His legs trembled. He wanted to bolt. Buck Jack was sure of it because he wanted to himself, and no one had asked for his soul in trade. Sir, Carlin began, his voice as husky as Harry's had been, leaking at the gills. Then he began again. Sir, there are obstacles. The face was still white, the legs still quivering, but he smiled and his voice was steady. Showtime. I'm sworn to 14 years' service to the cavalry, and 13 remain. The Fanatur nodded. 
but men have been released from such vows, and your crown might do so in return for, say, seven shore-leave belts to be made for navy merfolk, or, though as I said, I do not like to leave time for things to go wrong, you could take an oath to me, and when your time in the cavalry is done, I could come for you. Another obstacle is that it may simply be impossible. I know of no attempt to take a centaur into a troop, but I myself have tried to make seemings that would let you appear human again. I failed. Something awakes and fights back. Something resists any movement back to human, and it might not let you become a fae either. I simply do not know. But the greatest obstacle is that you very much do not want to. I see that. Let me try to reassure you. First, it only looks horrible from the outside. Petra, did you feel horror at being in the troop while you were in it? She shook her head, but she was staring hard at the troop, and Buckjack did not think she would be any happier to join it again. Second, as I become more expert, I will gladly loosen my grip and have you as my lieutenant within the troop. Finally, though I have no plans to let them go, he said, waving at the troop, we could agree that, like Petra, you could go eventually. When would that be, sir? The figure shrugged. That would require careful thought. When they took on more of your character one way or another, or it became clear they never would. And would I take on their character, sir? Another shrug with a smile. In a tight troop for a long time, it would be a risk, but you could fight it and I would help. Carlin's trademark smile had been fading and was now gone entirely. Oh, sir, he said, and his voice was husky again. As it is, I sometimes barely feel like myself any longer. I don't think we can deal. The mask tilted in acknowledgment. The fanator then stood still for a few seconds. Then the light, which had gone out behind the sunglasses, rekindled, white and steady. Then consider this. If you do not want to deal, will you gamble? Let us have a pair of wagers, one for the belt, one for you. If you want to take one wager, you must take the other. First, we will gamble for the belt, and if you win, it goes to the merman. Then we have a race from here to the wall. If I catch you, I have your service, if that is possible. Remember, it may be you simply cannot be joined to a troop. If it is not possible, we part as we have met. That gives you an edge. To Buckjack's dismay, Carlin's smile began to return. Huh. Well, sir, how will you chase me? I have only my four hooves. You could become a hummingbird, an arrow, a bullet. You could flit. I will pursue as a man on foot or on the horse I rode in on. The smile broadened. He's no horse, sir. The mount I rode in on then. And if I win the belt but lose the chase? As I said, the belt goes to the merman. We will arrange something. For instance, Mr. Weldon could take it. The mask faced Buckjack briefly. The light behind the sunglasses sped up from flicker to glitter. Then one glove rose, hovering over the end of the sleeve, one finger raised. But that brings me to another condition. Neither of us is to have any help. I accept riding Dayarok, since you, the floating glove gestured down at Carlin's legs, always have the advantage of traveling mounted, and Dayarok will act only as my steed. Sounds fair, sir. The flying glove lifted in warning again. Anyone who does help you, I will regard as lawful prey. The mask turned to Buckjack again. Like you, they would have shown that they would make a spirited, valuable addition to my troop. Buckjack made iron pillars of his legs and nodded. Within, I will not bolt, I will not bolt, I will not bolt. Understood, sir, he said aloud. The fanator turned to Petra. Anyone, he repeated. She nodded and gave him a cold smile. Buck Jack heard her breathing hard, which was interesting. Centuries of confusion and slavery. Friends and family lost. Personality washed away. Hope of heaven removed to an infinite distance. That could be Carlin's fate if he did not help, or his own fate if he did. I will not bolt. I will not bolt. I will not bolt. Can we deal now? The Thanatour asked Carlin. 
Buckjack saw Carlin's head move fractionally, but he still denied, not agreeing yet. Don't agree at all, Buckjack thought as loudly as he could at Carlin. Walk away and leave all as it was. What kind of gamble for the belt, sir? Carlin asked. The Thanator swept off his hat and bowed, giving a brief but clear view down his empty collar into the hollow shirt. Look at our motif. For the first time, the voice sounded animated, individual. Cowboys, the Wild West, poker. And Carlin's smile was back full force. No style, you may be a good player, but you're a year out of practice, and for all you know, he's the all fairy poker champion. I will give you a head start of 14 heartbeats, your heartbeats, from the moment you take up the belt or the moment you rise from the game as loser. Best two out of three hands, five card deal. Done, and the Fanatur extended a glove. Done, Carlin shook it. And we'll find out how the game goes next time.